insurance should not be a deterrent for any architectural firm to practice the way they want to practice. Business of Architecture, episode 289. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Today, I welcome Kevin Collins to the show. Kevin Collins is the underwriting manager for the professional liability program at Victor O. Schinner and Company, one of the largest providers of professional liability insurance for architects and engineers. Today, we discuss the top five things you should consider when getting professional liability insurance. If you haven't already, get free instant access to the four-part architecture firm profit map video that I've prepared specifically for podcast listeners by going to freearchitectgift.com. Enter your best email address on that page and you'll get instant access. And with that, on with today's show. Hello, Kevin. Welcome to the Business of Architecture. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you on here. And I thought we could start out our conversation today talking about something which is, I'm sure, near and dear to our listeners, which is E&O insurance, errors and emissions insurance. Yep, I'm, I, that, that always rings a bell for, for architectural firms as, the, as they practice. And I find with our clients and talking to folks, unfortunately, it's sometimes the, the last thing that they're thinking about um, from the standpoint of a, a proactive discussion, it's usually something that appears in a contract as far as a, a requirement that they need to react to. Mm. And what we, what we try to talk about and we want to give people information is really a, a process that they might be able to evaluate their practice proactively to see how error and emission insurance, professional liability insurance can fit into their practice, both to grow, Um, Because oftentimes owners or certain project types um, require professional liability insurance in order to provide services to that client or in that in that segment or in that geographical area. And as they look to grow, um, thinking about it now and getting themselves in a good position is really a you know a nice thing to do. Great. And what would you say? Let's jump into what would you say would be the top things that an architect architecture firm owner we need to think about as they're considering their obligations, their requirements, or their opportunities for this kind of insurance. Yeah, happy to. Well, I think that the first piece is we just have to acknowledge and, and recognize that a lot of architectural firms um, don't necessarily carry air and emission insurance. Um, and so getting a better understanding and making a, bus, uh, a better business decision of, of the risks that they face and how they might be able to leverage that more effectively. And, and I think to, to step back, the real, the real easy way to, to look at it is just recognize that uh, the courts have looked at architects much like they do uh, lawyers and doctors and other professionals and licensed professions, that there's a certain standard of care that every architect needs to abide by. Otherwise, they'll be found to be negligent. And so this concept of negligence came up in the 1950s, and from that sprung an insurance product, which has now become the air and emission policy that you see in the industry today. It's really there to provide coverage to the extent that an owner or a contractor or a, an individual that slips and falls at the location or, or other potential claimants allege that that architect um, failed to meet the standard of care. In a very simplistic standpoint, I think about like a house where you know, an architect doesn't specify the existence of a door. You know, you, at a very basic level, you if you have a home, you need to be able to get in and out of the house. So, you know, that that would be a, a standard of care issue. Uh, a lot of times we see uh, projects and claims, you know, falling in the gray area or the nuance around that, but it doesn't prevent individuals from filing a lawsuit or forcing you to defend yourself and incur costs you know, uh, to be able to defend that you, you met the standard of care. So there's value in it, even if, um, if the, the architect's practicing effectively in that environment. The first thing that I ask architects to do is, again, just to evaluate their business. Um, a lot of architects tend to focus or specialize in particular areas. Obviously, as they get larger, you can have multiple specializations. Uh, a lot of the small firms that we deal with tend to focus on the residential sector. Initially, it tends to be an earlier entry point, a lot more construction value going in place, smaller projects, other other ways to deal with that. 
And then you'll have more of the commercial practice, whether it's retail, et cetera, and then building into hospitals, schools, et cetera, and more of the, the larger projects. What, what we find is, especially on the residential side, owners are not requiring insurance. And so if not faced with that decision in the contract, what should the, the architect do? So you know, we, we, we ask and, and suggest that, that architects be aware of the risk that they have, um, that they are subject to standard of care and can be found you know, liable for negligence. And again, you know, anybody can make that allegation against them. And that insurance policy provides some financial protection uh, that uh, the policy will pay on their behalf to the extent that they incur claims expenses or an indemnity on that side. Uh, and I guess the final point in that evaluation is, is that a lot of the architectural firms that we've seen grow effectively over time has been proactive in that discussion to see the industries or areas of practice that they want to go into, recognizing that that owner group has an insurance requirement or will require insurance or the 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 size of the project or the complexity of the project, um, they just don't feel comfortable without having the insurance backstop um, to protect them financially, you know, to, to deal with that. Those are, those are all things that I think first step architect has to decide is, you know, what's best for their practice, but getting as much information as they can um, and evaluating, you know, what, where they want to be in the next three to five years or as they continue to grow. Kevin, help me understand this conversation about standard of care. Have you seen anything come across your desk that would surprise you or maybe be a little shocking to our audience when these kind of issues come up? Oh, absolutely. So, again, I think the the nuance is in the fact that that anybody can make a claim against an architect or engineer, um, even though they may not be founded on the fact that that it it breached the standard of care. So, again, the baseline of standard of care essentially says that if you're designing a home, a commercial building, et cetera, that if another architect was designing the same project at the same time at the same location, would they have made the same choice? So that's why I mentioned the the door and the home. You know, obviously any architect would say you need to have a door to to get in and out. But a lot of it, a lot of what we see is in those nuances. And uh, the vast majority of the claims that we see in our program, over 70% of the claims are made by the client in contract to the architect. So whether that's delays and um, extra costs alleged by the contractor and the owner then comes back and saying that the architect's uh, design errors or um, failure to respond to an RFI, et cetera, led to the, to the claims. But even with that, you do get some, some crazy things where we've had situations where architects are brought into lawsuits. Uh, somebody slips and falls outside of a, a property that they designed next to a fountain with the allegation that the specification of the marble or the stone material was inappropriate because the fountain in a windy environment will blow water onto the, to the stone and create a, you know, a slippery area. Um, those types of, of claims will, will come up as well. Um, again, you just, you don't know the, the angle by which it'll come, but everybody's got, you know, um, that type of exposure on every project. And what's the scenario if an architect doesn't have any E and O insurance and one of these claims happens to them? Yeah, then then it's uh, your assets against that. So if you are uninsured, uh, there's no limitation on the individual that makes the claim against the architect. Um, however, without the the insurance policy providing the financial protection, then it's going to be the assets of the firm or the personal assets of the firm depending upon how they are, um, they're filed for business. So if it's a sole practitioner, unincorporated, practicing as an individual, you know, they could be subject to um, not only litigation and costs, but financial risk, both at a personal and professional level. And that obviously has a huge impact on every business. Sure. And um, I, this might be out of your wheelhouse, but when we talk about entity formation, it was my understanding that no matter what entity you have, the architect would still be personal liable because he or she is a professional. Is that the case? 
Yeah, I'm a little bit outside my wheelhouse specifically on the, the legal issue, but the, the, the differentiation is every architect is individually liable against the claim. Um, depending upon the formation of the company or how it's formulated, you do have um, the element of the employer. If the, if the employee is rendering services on behalf of the employer, the employer has an obligation to protect you know, that employee. So if to the extent that they're all the same person or there's a limited group, um, there may be an opportunity to, to limit or they may not be subject to the, to the personal liability from a law standpoint, it may be limited to the corporate obligation, but, you know, every situation is a little bit different um, and, and they want to continue to, to evaluate that. But the important part is, is that if you are sued or you're held liable in a situation and you don't have insurance, rarely is, you know, there's, there's not going to be enough money to, to cover that loss. And you end up, you know, filing bankruptcy, going out of business, um, and so the, the level of impact may vary, but the, everybody has an impact. Gotcha. Now, when to, let's talk for a bit here about indemnity clauses. I don't know a whole lot sure. about them, but is there such a thing as an indemnity clause that would limit any sort of legal action for the architect to their sole and willful negligence? Like could, a, could an architect indemnify themselves and... Uh, you know, limit that to the sole and willful negligence of themselves so that other stakeholders in the project, for instance, subcontractors or consultants actually have to indemnify the architect. Yeah, there's, there's a lot in that piece. So, so to, to, to break it down, you know, in a contract, you can negotiate any terms um, between you and the owner or you and the, and the sub consultants, and it would be subject to interpretation, you know, under the law, but as a, as a tool, in the industry, there are um, things like limits of uh, limitation of liability um, that could be attached, um, and most states may accept that. So they could limit it to uh, the architect's fee. So in other words, if there's a loss or an allegation of negligence that's proven, it could limit it to their fee. It could be limited to a specified amount, um, and that could that could flow down to the to the sub consultants as well. The, the one thing about professional liability insurance is pretty much every, almost, I guess, every policy has some form of what's called a, a contractual liability exclusion. And the, the idea there is that there, the insurance company is not going to provide coverage to an insured for any contractual obligation that they agree to. Uh, but there is a carve out, which then becomes what's called limited contractual liability coverage. And it says that if you're sued for liability that you would have had in the absence of the contract, which means the standard of care, legal liability, negligence standard. So, and that's where identification clauses come in. So if in the contract, the indemnification clause says, I, the architect agrees to indemnify you, my client um, for any damages, costs, et cetera, arising from my negligence, you can, you can put that in the contract and have insurance standing behind it because it's formulated on the basis of negligence. And so you take the contract away, they still have that liability. If an architect in turn goes to the client and says, um, I agree with you that I'm going to pay you $5,000 a day if the architectural plans are not delivered to you by June 30th, 2019, um, then that you take the contract away, the, the court wouldn't say that, oh yeah, that's, that's negligence, but rather uh, an obligation that you've assumed for contractual liability. So that would be a variance of the negligence basis is covered, something direct damages or say, if I don't do this, I'm going to pay you X. That's a contractual obligation that's not covered. So part of that is when they're working with contracts, they're going to want to work with their attorneys, uh, utilize AIAs, um, standard agreements um, as time-tested language, but there are tools that they can use in the contract to try to limit or um, limit the the scope potential of the of the loss. Doesn't prevent the person from filing a lawsuit again, but when it's litigated, it may help to mitigate the you know the loss potential on that claim. All right. So for point number one, Kevin, you talked about the evaluation of the business and you mentioned sort of future considerations in terms of growth. Can you tell me more about that? 
Yeah. So the, I guess from the, from the growth standpoint, if it, 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 the, the, the limit, I guess I, if it's okay, let me, let, go ahead and ask that question again. Cause I'm going sure. a, a couple different ways. I want to make sure I'm going down the right road. Well, let, let's, let's dissect this. Help me understand a bit better sure. what you mean when you say your point number one is evaluation of the business. What are we looking at? What are we evaluating? What should our firm owners be thinking about specifically? Yeah. So the, the first part, the evaluation is around their business and because everybody's in business, everybody's um, having a practice and, and going forward. So that, that first level is focused on the, the individual architect and saying, where do I want to be? What areas do I want to grow? Where do I see myself in three to five years? And if, if, if they start to see the opportunity for growth and different segments, um, I think what they will find pretty quickly is that, that they will need E and O insurance or start to build the knowledge of acquiring that type of coverage in order to, you know, to grow um, the business effectively. Okay. So it sounds what I'm hearing is that if an architect is going into a new field or growing and expanding, taking on new types of projects that they need to be aware of the insurance considerations with those kind of projects. Correct. And, and, I, and to get to the conclusion or the thought process, I think they'll quickly see that uh, there are business barriers to that growth unless they have a professional liability policy in place. Uh, sophistication of the owners or the owner type, um, their base contract may require insurance coverage. So they're not going to get the opportunity to win that project. Or, or work within that segmentation or with that client base unless they have the coverage in place. So, so that obviously is the, the business impetus to say, if, if I want to do what I'm really looking forward to do, then this is a, you know, the ticket to the game is the professional liability coverage. What we want to emphasize as well is, is separate from that, there's a real um, inherent risk to the practice if, uh, they make a mistake or are alleged to make a mistake on a project and they don't have the coverage. So um, you know, continuing the evaluation of, of the best way to get the coverage is, is something I'm hoping every architectural firm will, you know, consider. Gotcha. Okay. So what is, uh, wait, that was number one. What's our second consideration here? So the, the next is really just trying to build, um, build around the expertise and trying to say, okay, I know nothing about professional liability insurance. I've now seen a little bit of the, of the background and the potential. Um, now I need to be a little bit more educated. Um, so where do I go and what do I do to, to properly evaluate the risk? So, so one area is, you know, hop on the internet and let's, let's go for a ride. Um, within our company, on our website, there's a, a vast host of information around claims examples, um, management advisories, or other elements, as you mentioned, about identification provisions, et cetera. So talking about different topics, specifically uh, the importance of insurance or areas of practice that present risk and how they're, they're evaluated. Um, I always say that the best client is the client that has, you know, uh, around a lot of information to best evaluate, you know, and make a, a good business decision. So, so that would be the second point is to, to get educated. Um, if they know they want to go into, let's say commercial projects or they're looking to move into the Southeast or another different geography, you know, try to find information around um, claims or risks that they see regionally or um, where architects are having issues over the years. We've seen, um, soil conditions, for instance, in Colorado have been very problematic. So foundational problems on those projects have generated a lot of claims over the years. Um, in the Carolinas, uh, the, the humidity and the heat vari variation between winter and summer uh, puts a lot of stress on the mechanical systems. So architects working with mechanical engineers and specifying systems effective for the project you know, is an area that's helped to, to mitigate risk in that territory. So there's a lot of different information available that architects can draw upon, um, depending upon, you know, where they're going with their practice and how they want to uh, evaluate. But um, they just need to, I think, just getting yourself smarter and thinking about um, 
again, overlaying where you want to go to and, and being able to see the information around the risks or where firms are having more success in, in areas of focus. Okay. So, so far we have number one is the evaluation. Number two sounds like you're speaking about educating ourselves in terms of the different kind of claims and the different kind of factors that go into getting insurance. Exactly. Which really moves in right into the next, the next piece, which is once you've evaluated your internal practice and where you want to go and you've gotten yourself, you know, as smart and educated as you can, I hope everybody comes to the realization that there's no way to know everything. And there's a lot of things that I don't. So the, the third piece is really surrounding yourself with a team of experts to help you put that in place. Uh, I would imagine every architectural firm has got experts in place just to run the business. So whether they're working with a, an accounting firm to help manage the, the finances or hiring a, a controller or somebody internally to be able to deal with that. Um, oftentimes they're dealing with corporate counsel or outside counsel to help them with negotiation of contracts and evaluation of that, tax advisors, et cetera. Um, from the standpoint of insurance, you really need to select a, an advisor um, with a focus on you, and that would be an insurance broker or agent in their area that has a specialization with architects and engineers or design and construction that can help them make sense of what can be a very complicated language and process um, to navigate, you know, the, the insurance industry. Uh, uh, having that partner in conversation, they oftentimes will be able to ask the right questions of, the, you know, what they're looking for in the practice, what the requirement is, how they want to operate. And although we're just talking about professional liability insurance here, there's other business insurance, uh, general liability, property, auto, uh, workers' compensation, et cetera, that every business may need. And an insurance broker with that specialization can, can often be a single source of um, providing the best solution and, and giving you the best approach to, to deal with your practice. So this is really the, you know, what you need to to, to really execute on the plan of, of getting the professional liability insurance. You know, one thing I would say as an underwriter, and so my background is one where we get, you know, applications, meeting with the firms, um, and trying to make a determination of both the exposure that the firm has and risk um, to try to find the right terms and pricing uh, appropriate for that individual architect. And what I think it's important to architects to know is, you know, what's really going to set them apart or what puts them in the best light when your insurance broker is presenting the application to the underwriter, you know, in that review. So there, there's, you know, there's a lot of different mousetraps in the industry from the standpoint of how uh, professional liability underwrites, underwriters evaluate architects, but there are some consistencies or areas that you can look at. One is, uh, the revenues of the firm is, and the location of the practice is often the biggest driver of cost. So as an architect, if you're in California versus New York or Florida, there would be some variance in cost between that, recognizing um, the experience that, that insurance, insurance carriers had in those states. Because obviously the location of the practices that you're providing services for who's going to generate the claims and what's the claims experience been within those territories. But this is also a way of evaluation of, of exposure. And so if a architectural firm is, you know, larger and, and building more revenues, then that firm is generally going to pay more money than a, a firm that's smaller with less revenues. So location and, and revenues is the kind of the determination of exposure risk. Um, but once you get past that, um, there's a lot of distinguish, um, distinguished elements. So one would be description of practice. So architects, if they've got a, in, you know, if they provide interior design services or they hire specialized consultants as part of their practice, um, they want to make sure on the application that they provide that level of detail to, to the underwriter because somebody providing interior design services you know, is a little bit of a different exposure than full service architectural. So getting to know the firm and, and how they're structured um, is important as well. 
there's there's other questions talking about risk management practices, use of in-house quality control procedures, written contracts, et cetera. Um, that's another area that uh, really helps uh, distinguish or set aside firms, you know, as we evaluate them. We find that firms that have good risk management practices, even if they haven't bought insurance before, is a really good indicator of um, potential for future claim or poor loss experience. So um, if they're doing a lot of things correctly in-house or um, trying to, to build a strong quality control program, putting that on the application, even if it requires an attachment with a, you know, a couple paragraphs is of real value um, in allowing the firm to get the best price and the broadest coverage um, possible for their firm. How does a firm that does design build, how does this affect their E&O insurance? Um, a, a couple different ways. So, so one element, and I, I'll be able to speak specifically to the, to the CNA program that, 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 that I underwrite for, is you have uh, the underwriting evaluation, which is what comes through on the application, versus the policy form, or what the coverage provides. So from the coverage standpoint, uh, we still provide the you know, same coverage or broad coverage for the architectural exposure, whether they're in a, a design bid build, traditional um, relationship or design build. Uh, so from that standpoint, the, the coverage tends to stay the same. You're, you're covering for the design area, you're covering for the design liability in that, in that process. The difference is really just the contract structure. So one thing that's really important there is we're following the contractual responsibility. So when we say design build, oftentimes in the industry, all that means is the owner is hiring a, a single purpose entity, whoever that is, to design and build the facility. Um, in our experience, oftentimes that is a contractor that is being hired by the owner and the architect may be a subconsultant to the contractor and the delivery of services. So for us, if, if the architectural firm has a true design build exposure, that means that they are hired by the owner under contract for both design and construction. And the architect may be hiring a contractor to perform the build function. And there's some architectural firms that have capabilities on, on both sides as well. But that would be the scenario where the architectural firm is taking on contractual responsibility for construction that the pricing of that risk would be a little bit more. Not that we can't provide coverage, but they, they would be paying a little bit more premium because the owner, again, is looking to one entity for both design and construction. So there's, there's, there's no way to separate the loss in that situation. Um, other other um, subcontractors or subconsultants may be liable as well, but you're in the, in the position of being hired directly by the owner for all of the services. So um, in that capacity, you're going to be they're going to be in the claim regardless. Now, that being said, um, we have a lot of firms that practice both with design build and in other areas, whether it's public-private partnerships or um, integrated project delivery or other structures similar to design build that have some element of, of shared responsibility or additional responsibility. Um, and they, they practice very effectively. So, in that situation, it's more about recognizing the exposures that you have to that type of risk and maybe evaluating your internal control procedures or project team selection and how you deal with that so that you can manage it more effectively. Um, you know, it, it's really eyes wide open. You know, that one you might need to hug a little bit tighter or you want to be, have a strong project manager during construction phase because design build tends to move a little bit faster. You know, things are not as um, separated between the contractor and the design professional. Des design decisions are being made in the field as the, as the building's going up. So again, there, there's a lot of ways to practice successfully. Um, and the insurance should not be a deterrent for any architectural firm to practice the way they want to practice. It just to be effective, they may need to evaluate different areas of their business or be more conscious of uh, areas of their business to, to be most effective. So Kevin, thanks for that. And when we look at the further considerations, what else comes to mind? 
Well, I think the most important thing, because we've spent a lot of time talking about the evaluation and getting to the point of should I have it and selecting the coverage and so forth. But the last piece that I would make is just make sure that the insurance policy that you purchase or that you're, you're selecting has something behind the paper. And what I mean by that is for architectural firms that practice most effectively, you continue to, to educate themselves and learn um, in their practice. And uh, a professional liability carrier um, often provides services or information outside of the insurance policy itself to allow the architectural firm to do that. So um, last piece would just be in the evaluation of the program that they want to purchase. Ask or see if they've got risk management information available uh, to the firm. Do they have ongoing webinars, continuing education that the architectural firm can take advantage of on current topics or tried and true um, elements of, of managing the business that they can, they can rely on? And then lastly, um, seeing if they have industry information uh, that they can continue to use as they continue to manage their practice. Because uh, where the firm is looking out three years may not be where they want to be 10 years from now. So you want to be with an insurance carrier or have access um, with a professional liability insurance company to, to utilize the information they're seeing every day and see what you can do to continue to improve your business going forward. Got it. So I, I've definitely seen insurance carriers providing information because it's obviously in the best interest of an insurance carrier to re- help educate their architects that they're covering to reduce their liability, make smart decisions in the design. So this is what we're talking about here is this ongoing continuing support that insurance providers give architects to help them produce a better product and avoid lawsuits. Yep, because we know that practice changes, projects change, codes change. There's a lot of change in the industry, and, and you want to be able to have access to how best to evaluate and, and be effective regardless of the business environment that you're in. Absolutely. Great. So I think you had one final point for us here on insurance considerations. What is that? I would say just, just to be smart. So again, take it, take it in little pieces. This is a lot of information to, to get around. If nothing else, you can always find your expert early. So if, you're, if, if you want to kind of pick up the process, you know you need to evaluate it and want to get off to the fastest start possible, um, find the team that you need to, um, to put you in that, in that position and, and get going with the, the evaluation process as quickly as possible. Great. And if our listeners want to find out more about your company, Kevin, where do they go to do that? They can go online at www.shenera.com. And if you don't mind, I'll spell that because sometimes it's not as, as clear. Shenera is S-C-H-I-N-N-E-R-E-R.com. And once you get up there, you can just click on the architects and engineers. And from that, you'll have a wealth of information, including a lot of the risk management material that we've um, talked about today. Great, Kevin. Well, it's been a great conversation and thanks for joining us on the show. Thanks very much. And that is a wrap. As a podcast listener, I'd like to invite you to two free online educational seminars for firm owners. The first teaches you how to structure your firm to avoid the overwhelming fires that plague so many firm owners. If you're ready to move from overwhelmed operator to excited owner, visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar to access this free online training. The second seminar you can access shows you how to attract your ideal clients to your firm consistently day in and day out. Go to architectwebinar.com to access this training. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.